the internet is a wonderful thing. You know, you can go in and uh, Google learning from failure and you get all these beautiful slides. Failure is the road to success. <laughs> the next exit is failure. <clears throat> You're riding the train and you look ahead and that's what you see. That's not a good thing. Sometimes you can see it coming around the corner or coming around the bend. This is me a few years ago trying to find a bed for a patient in a full hospital. <laughs> This gentleman, failure should be our teacher, not our undertaker. Failure is delay, not defeat. It is a temporary detour, not a dead end. Failure is something we can avoid only by saying nothing, doing nothing, and being nothing. How profound. And I feel like such a failure, Dad. Come on, son, you're only 16. I was over 40 before I was sure I was a failure. <laughs> so we're going to introduce our panel members in a moment. Um, first, the ground rules. We're going to have our case presentations. Uh, they're going to speak about some uh, vignettes in their careers, uh, which uh, recount uh, potential opportunities from learning from things maybe not going entirely well. Um, the, the scenario will be basically what was the intended outcome? Where did things maybe go off the rails? You'll have a chance to ask them clarifying questions of fact uh, after their presentations. We will then have some table breakouts. I'm not going to tell you which session you have, which vignette you're discussing. I want you to listen carefully to all three. Then you will be assigned your, your uh, case. Uh, we'll have report outs from the tables. Uh, the panelists will have their chance to uh, indicate sort of the last word on the topic. Um, I'm going to review a brief article about um, uh, learning from failure. And then uh, we'll break up and have dinner. So our panelists include Tim Link, uh, MHCDS, class of 15, a great classmate, graduated from the University of Michigan with a BS in Industrial and Operations Engineering uh, in 2009. Is that possible? Yeah. You're so young. Yeah. <laughs> he recently graduated from Dartmouth College with the MHCDS, and he has moved from the uh, Bureau of Medicine and Surgery, uh, contracted to the Department of the Navy, now is with United Healthcare. Thank you, Tim. Uh, our next panelist is Christine uh, Blasky, who is a pulmonary uh, physician and critical care medicine physician at North Shore Medical Center, which is a partner's affiliate in Salem, Massachusetts, there for the last 17 years. She's a graduate of the program in 14. And finally, our third presenter will be Robin Lunge, uh, who is with the uh, Agency of Administration uh, with the governor of Vermont is charged with coordinating and overseeing the state's health care reform efforts. In addition, she serves as the liaison to the Green Mountain Care Board, which is charged with designing and administering major components of the state's reform plan. Uh, I wanted to talk to you about shelving. Um, <laughs> so uh, I was asked to talk about a, a failure, but um, I'll talk to you about this project. Uh, so Kanban shelving. For those of you that are not familiar, is a, it's a Japanese term. Kanban is a Japanese term. I think it means sign. The idea being it's an easier way to manage inventory uh, using visual cues. So the, the system we implemented was a, a two-bin Kanban system. The idea being that inventory is stored in two separate bins. And you don't reorder that piece of equipment or that, that item of inventory until one bin is empty. Pretty straightforward. So there's a couple of examples up here. Uh, you know, there could be a front bin and a back bin, so you wouldn't, wouldn't reorder the supplies until that bin of supplies is empty. And so we were implementing this in uh, supply closets on various inpatient and outpatient units. So that's an example of what one looks like when it's all finished. So the, the idea, the objective is, you know, at the heart of, of the project, the objective is to get clinical folks out of the supply chain. We don't want nurses and we don't want doctors and, and uh, you know, these other medical folks coming in and managing inventory. We want them doing more patient work, getting back in front of the patients. So let materials management deal with that kind of stuff. So that's at the core of the whole project. And there's some other things you know, kind of circling that objective that we're trying to go for, things like saving money, uh, reducing amount of excess inventory, making it easier and faster to supply, uh, to you know, inventory manage, um, a host, a host of those things. But, at the end of the day, it's a, a dramatically different way of managing inventory than what the hospitals were currently doing. So 
I don't know if what I'm about to say is entirely true, but at, at one point, people could not believe that ships could sail without sails. So for a while, they were actually building ships with sails and engines simultaneously. So I mean, th just think of that, how hard it is for some people to, to adjust to change. I wouldn't say that managing supply closets in a hospital is quite as dramatic as this, but, but I think it really helps crystallize the, the image for me is um, how, ch how challenging change could be. One bit of kind of coordination for the project, and this is kind of where things uh, fell apart, where kind of our failures started to happen, um, was the coordination of the whole effort. So I, I was working at headquarters. We have two regions. And then there were three hospitals that we were implementing this project at. So at the headquarters level, you know, we have to communicate with the regions. We have to coordinate with the hospitals. Everybody all the way down that whole chain of command needs to know what's going on and understand why this project's taking place. And then I was responsible, or me and my, my office were responsible for managing the, the consultants we brought in to implement the shelves. So we had three teams, uh, two companies who were installing the actual shelves, so the, the folks that built the shelves themselves, and then one company who was responsible for all of the analytics. So uh, how many items are supposed to be stored in a room, what items are they, and then dealing with all the change management and training of the staff. So we, we were trying to effectively communicate up and down this chain of command and uh, manage the, the work being performed by those, by those companies. The point is, there's a lot of stakeholders involved, a lot of communication that needed to happen, um, and a, a lot of layers of oversight that needed to be coordinated with. So the intended outcome, of course, I, I mentioned the objectives here, but uh, we wanted to get them all done within a single fiscal year. Uh, so the diagnostics and implementation of, of each hospital. Diagnostics, diagnostics is like the analytics component. Um, implementation is, of course, putting the shelves in place. But what went wrong? Um, to start, you know, I, I don't think we had a real clear guiding coalition. Um, there were people out there that were supporters, but I don't think we had crystallized who they were and let them communicate at the right levels. Uh, I, I don't think there was a, an effective amount of communication to the various levels that I just talked about. Um, but again, that's my office's responsibility, but we, we just didn't communicate as much and as often as we should have. I think. I, I've heard this come up multiple times this week and it, it makes so much sense to me or I think it's so important. There wasn't a clear burning platform to change for the people at the, at the point where the work is taking place. The people we needed to manage inventory differently didn't quite understand that this, there was a problem. And then lastly, um, in managing those teams, the shelving vendors and the analytic vendors, there was a lack of trust between those two companies and, and my office, so making sure that we're hearing all the issues as they arise and making sure that the work is being done as expected. So that's kind of what went wrong uh, at, a, at a high level. And there's probably a, a much longer list than this, but to save some embarrassment, I didn't put them all up here. So at the, at the end of the day, what, what ended up happening was we didn't finish one of the hospitals in the time frame uh, we'd hoped. So this should actually be FY15 here, but one of the hospitals we had to, we're still working on today, or still is being worked on today. So we had to redo all of the diagnostics components, this again, and then they're implementing now. So major slips in the schedule, and hopefully it'll be implemented this year. And so that's my whole section. We'll save that for the end, but uh, I will hand it off. I would like to do is tell you a story about an experience that I, as a pulmonary critical care doc, have recently uh, faced in my messy inpatient world. So this is the mess of the hospital world. So I like to call it internal organization meets external chaos, or you could look at it as what doesn't kill you makes you stronger. <laughs> Okay, so really the question that I, I asked as I was putting this together was how do we preserve success and respond in response to multiple both anticipated and unanticipated external forces. So here's the clinical situation. My partners and I for the past 25 years have been the uh, primary clinical uh, directors of an inpatient unit at a rehabilitation hospital that takes care of patients who are dependent on mechanical ventilators. So these are patients who are ICU survivors, okay? So they've survived some 
critical surgical disaster, medical disaster, and during their prolonged recovery, they're reliant on mechanical ventilators, as is this woman through a surgically pl placed tracheostomy tube. They're awake, they're not in comas, they participate in physical therapy and occupational therapy, and the clinical goal for the patients and the staff is to get them off the vent and get home, hence the ventilator liberation unit. So for the past at least 15 years, we've had a, a multidisciplinary team that's worked very well together, doctors, nurses, uh, physical therapists, respiratory therapists. We've had excellent clinical outcomes, so exceeding or at least matching um, national benchmarks. Lots of patient and family satisfaction because they get better and go home. Uh, optimal census, the hospital is happy. And a lot of professional satisfaction. Now over the past couple of years, our well-oiled machine, so this is an example of staff members as well as the patient participating in bedside rounds. Um, our team has dissolved, and I'm going to tell you uh, some of the reasons why. So there's been a big change in the patient population. Um, as ICU care has improved, we see fewer patients with good potential to survive uh, the need for prolonged mechanical ventilation because we're getting patients off the vent faster in the ICUs. There's been a big staff turnover due to retirement, illness, <coughs> illness, and need for professional development that could not be met in this situation. Hospital priorities change. We went from a um, skilled, uh, not a skilled nursing, a uh, rehab hospital model to a long-term <coughs> long acute care model. And so the scope of patients that were being accepted changed from purely respiratory failure patients to patients with complex post-critical care needs. The lines of authority that determined how the program was run shifted and at the same time my group shifted their priorities and felt the need to spend less time in the hospital and more time, um, <clears throat> more time providing care in the clinic. So we knew many of these changes were coming. We helped the hospital shift the clinical model to include hospitalists as the clinical managers. This uh, change in situation caused a lot of apprehension in the, um, the non, um, sorry, I'm losing my voice, the non-MD staff. So we put a lot of time into education of staff, allaying their fears that the clinical model was gonna change. Uh, we did a lot of education to help the hospitalists understand the patient population. We set up structured information transfer, daily huddles, so we could all go over as a team what was going on with the patients. And yet, we were faced with additional pressures and chaos. Um, and these are some of the external factors that contributed to the dissolution of a really tight team. So what happened? Over the past two years, a very cohesive team has moved on in many different ways. So the best program manager ever has changed jobs. The unit secretary got sick, had to leave because of illness. A really strong nurse manager left. Uh, the respiratory therapists are looking, all the therapists are looking, and our group as the clinical micromanagers is gone. So our lessons learned, which I'll leave for your peruse, perusing, um, I think one of the things we learned was despite Herculean efforts to communicate the change in model, that we didn't spend enough time communicating with all the different stakeholders. Um, there was a change in authority so that a lot of the program decisions did not get a lot of clinical output, uh, input. Uh, there's a recognition that the change in focus really destabilized the established staff. And I think that's really one of the failures here because we knew there was change but we didn't anticipate how, how really personally some of the non-medical staff felt it. Um, and that's kind of our current failure. Uh, my name is Robin Lunge. I'm the Director of Healthcare Reform for the State of Vermont. Um, and I'm going to talk to you about Green Mountain Care. Um, but before I do, I would like you all to share a Kodak moment with me. Uh, and I think we should change the title of the session to Preparing for Future Success. 
So uh, Vermont has a very ambitious agenda for health care reform. Our health care reform efforts, I'm very good at projecting, so if this isn't working, I can probably just make it work. Um, these are our four goals for health care reform. We want to reduce health care costs and cost growth. I think that's a familiar one for many folks in the room. Assure that all Vermonters have access to and coverage for high quality health care. Improve the health of Vermont's population and assure greater fairness and equity in how we pay for health care. So we have these four very broad reform goals and we have multiple efforts uh, that we've been engaging in since uh, the, our current governor was elected in 2000, in the fall of 2010, starting in 2011. So what I'm going to talk to you about is Green Mountain Care. Green Mountain Care is uh, what, and I still think it will be, the first uh, state-based, universal, unified health care system, which many people have labeled single-payer. So we as a state, our governor's vision was to move to the, a single-payer health care system that would provide all Vermonters health care because they were Vermonters. So it was based on your residency, not based on who you worked for, uh, whether your family had access to coverage through uh, any other source. Uh, the program would comprehensively cover services and would have cost sharing on a sliding scale using the legal parameters set up uh, in the Affordable Care Act. So for those of you who are familiar with the Affordable Care Act in the private insurance system, uh, the ACA brought in premium tax credits that made uh, premiums a sliding scale based on income as a percentage of income and also cost sharing uh, based on, on a sliding scale based on income. And that's for individuals who don't have access to employers. We are going to apply that to all Vermonters. And then in order to accomplish this, uh, we would of course need to have some cooperation from the federal government. We are a state, we're not a nation, despite uh, sometimes wishing we were. Uh, so in order to accomplish this, we needed some collaboration to change what would is, are the typical rules in Medicaid, uh, how Medicare pays physicians, and um, also, of course, the Affordable Care Act. Because you can't really set up a universal single-payer system and have private insurance marketplaces all at the same time. It's really opposite ends of the spectrum. So uh, we, this obviously requires a lot of research, a lot of analysis, a lot of legal understanding, and a lot of uh, collaboration with the feds. So the big question is how are we going to pay for it? And actually before I get to this I should probably mention uh, in 2011, which is when the governor was first elected, in the first legislative session which starts uh, right when he gets sworn in, uh, we passed legislation at the state level that would do all of these things. So this pretty much within the first six months uh, the legislation for this was checked off as accomplished. Uh, at that time, however, we did not pass a financing plan, and there are a couple of reasons for that. First of all, uh, in Vermont, uh, like many other places, our governor is elected in November and then comes into office in January, starts immediately into a state legislative session. So there's really not a lot of time for planning prior to your first year of election. So passing financing in the first year was really not feasible or realistic from a practical standpoint uh, because this is, of course, a huge shift for folks. People are used to paying for health care either by con contributing out of their paycheck or writing a check to an insurance company. And so we really had to try and refocus the policy debate from uh, not thinking about this just as new taxes, but a different way of paying for something that you were already paying for. So instead of paying in a premium, you would be paying in taxes. So uh, in addition, of course, there's all these processes that would need to happen before we actually implemented. Uh, we needed to finalize an actual benefit plan. We passed a law that had general parameters for how to meet uh, a benefit plan, but then as all of you know in this room, there's a lot of nitty gritty details that need to be worked out in terms of coverage and uh, payment and all, everything at the very detailed level. Uh, in addition, uh, we were working on the financing plan. Uh, it, as a state-based program, it would need to go through another legislative process to appropriate the money. And uh, because uh, our initial legislation created 
a check for the program, uh, there were some triggers that were given to the Green Mountain Care Board, which is an independent five-member board, to make sure that all of the planning that we were doing between 2011, when the law passed, and 2017, when the first waiver from the Affordable Care Act is available, that, it, that there would be one more check before we pulled uh, the trigger, so to speak. So we did come up with a financing plan, um, and the financing plan that we came up with would be a uniform payroll tax on employers that would be just under 12%, uh, that, and that would be based on their Vermont payroll. So if you were Vermont payroll but you had New Hampshire employees, you didn't have to, you know, you didn't have to pay for payroll outside of the state. Um, and then an income-based public premium that would be based on a sliding scale. And you'll notice that this roughly, the sliding scale pretty much mirrors the Affordable Care Act sliding scale for the individual market between nothing for very low-income individuals who don't pay anything today because they are eligible for Medicaid to 9.5% um, of income at the higher income levels. Uh, in addition, it would... Um, we'd cap that 9.5% at a certain point because it really didn't seem reasonable to think that in the year that some family farm sold their family farm that they would pay a ton, you know, a million dollars for health care. So we capped it at 27.5, which is roughly what we estimated a family insurance product in Vermont to be in 2017. So we were working on the financing plan, and the idea was that we would be proposing this plan that we just went over this legislative session, and that we would start on the process of passing a tax plan this year uh, so that we would be able to implement the program in 2017. Uh, but when we did the economic analysis to see what that would look like for Vermonters, we realized we were uh, really having some major financial headwinds. So first of all, the original estimates of our state and federal funding uh, were less than expected, and there are a couple of reasons for that. Uh, with any sort of estimation process, when you're doing it in 2011, you need to make an estimate of what you will be paying towards Medicaid in 2017. Uh, we made some estimates about how much Vermont would really commit to keeping up with inflation in Medicaid, and those estimates did not come to pass. So this was really an, uh, an estimation process where we didn't get it quite right when we did it a few years ago compared to what we know now a couple years later. Uh, in addition, um, when you move from a, a plan or a, a really high-level policy document to an actual okay, we're going to start doing contracts and implementing this program on the ground, uh, there's really a different kind of approach that you would take. So uh, there are certain policy choices that at the high level were not apparent until later when we were thinking about, okay, now we actually have to think about how are we going to do the contracts? Who is going to administer the system? Medicaid today, for example, contracts out their claims processing, that we don't have a bunch of state employees sitting in a room, so why would we do that? We would contract it out. What would that contract look like? Uh, what would that bid process look like? So you have to get to a much more granular reality-based uh, sort of uh, planning exercise. Uh, also, it was really important that we were in a not great place in our economy. So like everybody else, uh, we were moving out of the recession, but we were moving out of the recession really slowly. We didn't go quite as deep as some other states, uh, but we're also not coming out of it quite as fast. And so that put additional economic pressures on Vermont. Um, and lastly, uh, we are a state of many, many, many small businesses. And when I say small, I mean really small, like 10 people, 15 people, 25 people, mom and pop stores, restaurants, local service and retailers. Uh, so easing the transition to a 12, almost 12% 12 payroll tax was really important because for some businesses in Vermont, for many of them, having that sudden expense without the ability to plan over a number of years would put them out of business and that's obviously not anyone's intention or really a positive outcome. So uh, that became a very important policy goal, but it's also extremely expensive. So I'm not going to um, go through all the details of this balance sheet, but this is a balance sheet that we ended up with where we had the 
total cost of the program and operations, what we expected from, from federal funds, and that gave us our bottom, bottom line for state taxes, which is how we backed into our revenue estimates. And you can see a couple of things from this balance sheet. First of all, we run a deficit by year four. Uh, that would be expected, you wouldn't expect your insurance product to have the premium stay flat for four years, but when you're talking taxes, people don't want to hear that their taxes are going up again in four years. And the re part of the reason for this dynamic is that even though we assumed a very, uh, that we would be able to achieve a very low health care cost growth rate of 4%, that still was growing faster than our economy. So if your economy grows slower than health care, you're not going to be able to keep up. I think everyone sees that dynamic in their Medicaid programs today. Um, in addition, we couldn't figure out how to do that transition for small firms. It costs half a million dollars. That adds 4% to the payroll tax or a 50% increase in the income tax. And so uh, we weren't able to sort out that very high policy priority for the governor. Uh, now, it's not like we didn't think about other things. We thought, what if we lower the benefits? What if we uh, take some people out? What if we, we had really wanted to eliminate provider taxes, for example, as a funding source? Um, what if we kept them in? So we, we did play with a number of different alternatives, but in the end, uh, the governor decided that now was not the time to move forward with proposing the financing plan. And so that decision was made in mid-December.